as you're more and more experienced in this business, you understand the power of accumulating more units, right? Yes. The bigger you get, the more powerful you are. And the whole game here is not to earn the most profit per property. It's to build a portfolio. Hello, everybody. It's Jake Senziato, host of the Wheelbarrow Props Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, chef, father, six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy. Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going? <laughs> Mr. Stenziano, I am rubbing off on you. Every week, it's a different color shirt. I just, you're looking Dang. sharp every week, bro. Hey, every time you come into my city, bling, bling. <laughs> all right, that's how we're doing it. Hey, you got a special guest today. Our guest today has been in commercial real estate in Florida since 1999. He began his career in the apartment industry, working in property management. That's where you get started, <laughs> hey. learning, learning from the ground up, and eventually became ranked as numero uno, number one multifamily producer in Florida for his brand, and was among the top five in the nation every year bef before starting his own multifamily brokerage in 2021. So without further ado, Mr. Bo Berry, welcome to the show. Brother, I'm on the Jake and Gino show. I have arrived, my family. I have arrived. <laughs> the question is, where have you arrived to? That's what we're trying to answer today, right, Bo? Hey, it's the peak of podcast. <laughs> hey, guys, guys, I'm excited about this because I cut my teeth in property management. That's what changed my life, doing, doing the hard work from the ground up. So, Bo, I, I got to hear from you. Tell me about the start in property management because I think that's going to be so important to our listeners. I'm telling you, man, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm really fortunate. And it was just all luck to have started in multifamily at that place. And as you know, just to be able to, to, be able to see the kind of maintenance requests that come in, to, to see how you lease stuff, how the leasing paperwork is done, handling tenant requests, handling tenant disputes. Um, so it was, in, it was in 98 or 99, I was going into the gym, a buddy of mine, um, you know, I just graduated uh, with my marketing degree at UF. I walked into the gym. He said, Hey, we're, you know, we're looking to hire a leasing person. Um, I said, sure. You don't have anything yet. Right. So I went and started, actually started with Tremble Crow residential, which was again, by luck, the number one apartment developer in the country. That was my first job, you know, on site making $35,000 a year salary plus, you know, commissions for leasing and uh, Tremble Crow was phenomenal. They, they had a really good education program. And so I was driving from Gainesville to Orlando to take classes all the time, you know, tenant law, landlord law, all this stuff. And while I was there, um, they would also pay for your real estate license. So I got my real estate license um, while I was there. But, but my, the greatest stuff I, that, I, that I was able to learn was my property manager was really cool. She was my boss and she would show me the books. Like she would show me the balance sheets, the income statements. And I'm looking at these, these income statements and I'm, it was a 440 unit, 444 unit property. And I was watching basically 800 people pay for this where the time was a $32 million asset. And I never saw the owners. And I'm like, I'm like, I got to be a part of this business. This is insane. Like you could, if you watch the debt being paid down, you watch these people paying for stuff. And I watched how the property was maintained. And you, you, know, you fast forward, it's been over 20 years now, that property just traded like four or five years ago for 56 million. It's easily worth mid, you know, low to mid 60s today, mm -hmm. right? And just, and you know, you just, you just value add it over and over again and you keep the rents up, you keep competitive with other properties nearby and it pays for you forever. But man, when I saw those balance sheets and I saw the income statements and I got the training, I'm like, this is, this is it. Like I got, I got to know how to do this. <laughs> so, so Bo, let me ask you in property management, how did that make you become a better investor? Cause you're talking about income statement and you're talking about expenses. What experiences did you pull from your property management days to say, Hey, this is going to make me a better investor. Uh, you know, the, the underwriting was a big deal, right? So a lot of, a lot of brokers, they'll use industry standards uh, from the National Apartment Association Income and Expense Report. And that's a great report. And I like it a lot. But when you understand, you know, from the expense side, you know, the cost of actually running a property from the repairs and maintenance category, mm -hmm. the utilities, you know, how, how, how you know, shower heads affect things, um, the type of um, the, the type of tenant calls that you get on a regular basis, because of how something is built, um, you know, and so to be able to, to uh, you know, give advice to owners as they're doing new construction on apartments, 
I walk through a lot of new construction assets while they're under construction with some of my customers. And I'll point to things like, dude, you, you, you cannot do that right there. Like that, that one's going to cost you money. I've seen it a million times. You're going to get 500 phone calls every Give two me an years. Example. Give me a real life example. Um, you know, actually, actually a big one that I, that I like is sort of on the opposite side is I, oftentimes uh, when, when folks are putting in closets and bedrooms, there's oftentimes a lot of space between the top of a closet and the ceiling. And so what I've seen tenants love is um, developers will put in, will cut out boxes above the closet that have doors that open up top. It's just like extra storage mm -hmm. or underneath staircases. There's, there's areas underneath there that people in apartments want storage, especially when they're retention, building homes. Right. That's right. Retention. So I'll, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Point pointing out things like that. Some of the toilets and the shower heads that they use are sometimes really, really expensive, especially if it's going to be all on one rubs on, on, a, on a, uh, if it's electric, if it's water and sewer carried onto the buildings, there's just a bunch of little things as I'm walking through that I can point out some of the landscape stuff. Like, you know, some folks build things where I just know tenants are going to park up on the grass. You can just, you just can't, anytime you leave a gap where someone can go and there's no curb there, they're going to park up on the grass and then get close to their apartments. It's, you know, it's little stuff like that. But, but I, I just, I'm, I'm so fortunate I've had that start in, in the management side. How did you transition from management to getting into the brokerage side? Um, so after Trimble Crow, uh, I got, I was so inspired. I worked there for three years. I'm like, you know what, I'm, this is my career. I'm going to do this. I went back and I got a master's degree in real estate at UF. They have one of the top five programs in the country. It took me a year to get in. I had to take the GMAT course and, you know, I had to do all kinds of other stuff in order to get in, but I got in and that was in 2001 during that program. Uh, the board of directors that make up that program is 150 of the who's who in Florida real estate. And I was able to network with a ton of these guys during that one year program. And some of the folks I met were, were really inspiring to me on the sales side. And, you know, there's, they only allow 30 uh, students per year from around the world to get into the program. And almost everyone coming out of that program wanted to do development. Like that was the cool, sexy thing. And so did I. I wanted to go into development. But I met my wife during the program. And my wife was one of those few people who was born and raised in the same town she went to school and actually wanted to stay there and instead of going as far away as possible. So upon graduation, I had, a, I had a choice like, do I love this woman? Yes. Is she going to stay here in Gainesville? Yes. Okay. I'm in a small town. It's not a whole lot of developers around, but there's one big guy who's, who's the best in town. And it's called the AMJ group, a guy named Mike Warren. He's pretty legendary in the Southeast. And so I interviewed with him. I interviewed with a bunch of people, but he was the best. And I said, listen, I said, I want to go into development. That's what I want to do. He was a big developer in town, did office, retail, multifamily. And he said, what? He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I'll teach you development, but I need help leasing my assets now. So I actually started off doing leasing for office, retail, industrial. And then after a couple of years, I did acquisitions for all of those assets and multifamily. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of years later, I, I would be I would be putting in equity as well and buying alongside him. He and I still own assets together today. And then in 2000, uh, in 2000, I think it was eight or nine, maybe 2010, I had the opportunity to acquire a Coldwell Banker and a Coldwell Banker commercial franchise mm -hmm. um, with some partners. And so mm -hmm. I, I bought those those uh, those those companies with friends and they ran the business. And then all I did was broker multifamily. All right. So let's get into the multifamily brokerage. When you're dealing with investors, give us some tips on how investors should actually treat brokers. And what mistakes are you seeing investors make when they're dealing with brokers? Yeah. So the, the first thing to understand is that, you know, I, I find that a lot of investors don't know how many transactions are controlled by brokers in the first place. Now, mm -hmm. as, as I talk throughout this program today, please don't think that I'm trying to, you know, bolster up brokers as though they're some sort of God. It's, it's not, that's not it at all. The reality is, is that in, in the mind of an investor who owns a $10, $20 million asset, you know, you want to get the best value for your property that you possibly can. For someone to sell, quote unquote, off market to one buyer who calls them doesn't make any sense at all today. Anyone who owns anything over 20, 50 units, you're going to hire a broker. And so I did a study 
from January 1 of 2015 to December of 2019, it was a five-year period. And I covered the entire northern half of Florida from Orlando, Lakeland, Winter Haven, and North. I studied 350 transactions, which was 31% of every deal that was done. And I, did, I literally called every buyer, seller, broker on every transaction and determined that 92.55% of every closing over 10 units is done by a broker, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of programs out there that teach how to write letters to sellers, how to call a seller directly, how to, you know, how to get that off-market deal, how to get that great price. And there are folks who have done that. And, that, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. I'm here to tell you that if you take the guy who does nothing but tries to buy off market directly from a seller with no other broker involved and tries to be the only human being on earth that that seller is talking to, and you put his performance next to the guy who does nothing but networks with brokers, this guy is going to smoke this guy by 20 fold all day long. It's a fact. I've seen it happen over my 20 year career. The people who are the best in this business, the people who own the most number of units who do the most number of transactions per year, all they're doing is networking with brokers. It's networking with brokers, but it's also operating in a manner in which you attack, you, you attack every transaction during the transaction and after the transaction with a frame of mind that you're going to keep the best reputation in place, right? So, so you know, some of the things I see during a transaction you know, one, one, one of the big ones is retrading, right? But it's not just about retrading. Let me tell How you- How often are you still seeing retrading though? Because I feel like it's, it's such a naughty word right now and people want to do repeat business. So, I mean, just got, dive into that because that's a hot topic. Yeah, I would say, you know, if, if you take anything from, if, if you call a retrade anything that veers from a PSA, probably 20, 25% of the time easily, Right. And, and the, the ones that give me the most problems are the smallest issues, right? So let me give you an example. And I, I write about this in my book. There's, this is a perfect example. If you've got like, a, let's say you're looking at a $20 million property. If a $500,000 issue comes up, whatever it is, something that the seller didn't know about, the buyer didn't know about, the broker didn't know about, something's come up during due diligence, that always gets worked out because it's such a big issue that the seller knows he ain't going to be able to sell this to anybody. No buyer is going to buy this unless that gets solved. And so somehow, you know, it gets worked out. Either the price comes down to 19.5 or they share the cost or whatever it is. It gets worked out because it has to get worked out. It's when I have a $20,000 issue or even a $100,000 issue on a $20 million asset. That's where the problem comes up. That's where egos come into play yes. and all the financials leave it. So what happens is the buyer says, Bo, hey, listen, this little $20,000 thing that came up, seller just needs to take care of that. It's not my problem. It's not my fault it came up. You know, we need to, re we need to reset the price to 19, $19,980,000 19, or $19,900,000. Let's just say it's a $100,000 issue. And then what happens is the seller says, Bo, seriously, you're coming to me with a $100,000 issue on a $20 million deal. I tell you what, tell this buyer he needs to close or we're going to the next guy. They're both saying the same shit to you though. They're saying the same say. things to each other, yeah, right? Yeah. And so then the buyer says to me, Bo, like, dude, it's it's $100,000. Like, it's not a big deal. It's a $20 million deal, right? So what happens is, is people go to battle over tiny shit. The reality is, if you have a spreadsheet in front of you and you're looking at cash on cash and IRR and you take a $20 million deal to $19,900,000, your IRR ain't moving. It ain't moving more than like a quarter of one point or a half of one point, whatever it is. And your cash on cash ain't moving much at all, right? And so my point is, is that if you, if you just, you know, man up, close on, <laughs> close on the deal. Do what you say you're going to do. Do what you say you're going to do. Five years from now, when you sell that $20 million deal for $24 million, what the hell is $100,000? It's absolutely nothing. It doesn't mean anything. But in the meantime, you've ruined your reputation. You pissed off the broker. You're never going to see another deal from me again. I, I don't want to be embarrassed like that again. I was embarrassing that you came to me with $100,000 on a $20 million deal. That seller who owns six other assets and his friends with dozens of other investors who own six assets each, who are at a party together talking. They're and blackballing, you know, Gino. 
Right. And they're, they're all talking. Oh, hey, 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 George, uh, I heard you, you know, so I heard you didn't end up selling uh, the so and so apartments to, uh, you know, to Jake and Gino. What happened? Well, <laughs> Jake and Gino, you know, a little hundred thousand dollar Nick came up and they got scared and they tried to retrade. I told them the whole last we ended up selling it to X, Y, Z apartments. Right. And so that that word gets spread. And then what happens is, is, you know, the brokers talk, you know, I'm friends with all the brokers in, in, in the northern half of Florida. And we talk about things and we were on podcasts together and we have conversations about how to do more business together. And we talk about, hey, Jake and Gino did this or Jake and Gino did this for the positive. You know, whatever it is, it's a very small world. OK, and to drive home the, fe- the drive home the point for the entire northern half of Florida which is arguably one of the top five states in the entire country for multifamily. I would, you know, it's one of the five hottest, right? Mm-hmm. The entire Northern Apple Florida, there's only 1,959 assets over 10 units. Those 1,959 are owned by only 993 people in the world. REITs, mom and pops, syndications, whatever it is, only 993. Of the 1959 assets, there's only 866 that are over 100 units, and those are owned by only 403 people in the world. It's a very, very small world. 400 people, they, a lot of them talk. And I mm-hmm. told you there's only 60 multifamily brokers, right? Mm-hmm. And 20% of those, the 80-20 rule, so 12 of those brokers, they're, we're doing the majority of the business, and we talk all the time, right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, it's just... The, the, 50% the, of those are probably owned by like, you know, a hundred guys or something. Well, like actually the, the, down. The, yeah. the stats are the following. And this yeah. is, this is in any market, the stats I'm going to give you in Texas, New York, whatever it is, the, the same power is, is throughout in the Northern half of Florida, the top 1% of owners own 11% of the assets. The top 5% of owners own 27% of the assets. Right. And then if you take, Half the inventory, half the inventory, uh, let me back up a little bit. So only, there are 66% of owners that own only one property and 17% own only two properties. So if you take the 66 and the 17, that's 83% of owners own only 50% of the properties. Wow. So the, only, the other 17% of people own the other 50%. Wow, that's fascinating. And that keeps going up more and more every year because- the more assets you own, the sexier you are to me. So in every multiple offer situation, if you got Jake and Gino that own 3,000 units, right? And, and, and 1,000 of those units are within two hours drive time of my listing. And you got another guy that has, you know, three complexes of 200 units each and they're scattered around. Even if this guy is offering 10% more than you, I'm consulting with my seller. We need to go with Jake and Gino. These guys are closers. They have great reputations. They're going to show up to closing. That extra 10% ain't going to mean jack. In fact, it's going to get cut way down. If we choose this guy and he backs out, it's going to make it harder for me to go back to Jake and Gino and do a deal with them. Mm -hmm. Jake and Gino. Bo, let me ask you this question. As far as the retrading, give me some ideas as to what could be a retrade. Let's say, for instance, I get financials and they're totally wrong and your NOI is 20% less. Would you be comfortable retrading on that? Or let's say I didn't see the roofs or some major cast iron plumbing issues. Would you have issues as a broker to say to your seller, hey, listen, this popped up. Why did you give them these financials when they were wrong? Now they're, now we see the real financials. Economic occupancy is really 80%. It's not 94, like you said. Give me some instances what, where you're yeah, okay What's the with- list of retradable offenses that, that passes the I mean, smell test? You know, dude, I mean, that's a great question. I, I just, I rarely see... Well, let me just say, once you get under 20, 30 units, that's where you're running into wild, the like, wild and crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, it's the people who are inexperienced at transacting yeah, yeah. who the, these sellers who are inexperienced and don't transact much per year, they think they can pull one over on someone. Right. Mm-hmm. So I just looked at a listing the other day with 22 units over in Daytona Beach and, and the expenses per unit were like $1,800 a unit per year. I know for a fact, through my experience, there's no way in hell on God's green earth you can ever run, you can't even run a quadruplex for less than thirty five. It's all capex, Bo. It's also all capex, right? Right. <laughs> so, so it's 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 actually quite rare that I ever see anything over 30, 40, 50 units in which a seller deliberately was trying to bullshit 
or give or give you know false financials. But in the event you come across that, let's let's say that you had a you know the, the offering memorandum you know basically had uh, you know actuals in there typed in, and that you had not gotten you know spreadsheets from the actual property managers. You go to contract. You get the spreadsheets, you start diving dig, uh, deeper into the actual um, repair register where you can look at line items and you start like, whoa, 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 this, this, if that happens, yeah, that's a retradable offense. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just a direct deliberate lie from a seller, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you got to, it doesn't make any sense. And so the problem is most of the time, if someone's going to be that deliberate from the sell side, you're probably not going to get them to reduce the price or do it. They're just, they're already, they're at it. They're already out of their mind. They're not someone who you and can. What else, what else is with. wrong with it? Mm -hmm. um, title is also a big one. I mean, listen, if there's any title issues or survey issues. I mean, those are retradable offenses and not necessarily retradable. It's one of those things where the seller just has to take care of it. So you can close to begin with. Right. Um, but I would say, you know, we can lump every, as far as retradable offenses for me, it's a dollar value. I don't care what it is. I don't, it, whether it's, it, it, let's just say it's galvanized piping and they said it wasn't or whatever the case may be, you have to understand as an investor, there are 11 guys praying to God, Jake and Gino back out. And they're all, all at asking price or higher. And so you as the buyer have to determine, okay, listen, this guy said it was not cast iron piping. It is cast iron piping. It's going to cost me 300 G's to, to make this work. Let me plug this in my pro forma. Does it actually affect my IRR on a five-year hold or on a 10-year hold or whatever it is? Okay, because you, what you have to understand is if you go back to the broker and you say, hey, I need $300,000 off or I want to split it with the, with the seller at $150,000, you have to be prepared for that seller to tell you to haul ass. And by the way, as soon as you ask the broker for this, what the broker is going to first do with the seller permission is he's going to call the next three guys and he's going to say, hey, George, listen, we're in contract with the group. They determined that there is cast iron piping. We didn't, you know, I didn't know that as the broker, the seller probably knew that, right? And just didn't, didn't cough it up. They're wanting to retrade this. If the seller tells this guy to haul ass, are you ready still to prepare to move forward on your price knowing this? Okay, you are cool. Let me call buyer number two back up. Let me call buyer number three back up. So now the seller and I can make a decision. Do we want to, you know, kind of go ahead and power forward, make Jake and, Jake and Gino go hard on their deposits, give them $150,000 off and close? Or do we want to start over and earn that extra $300,000 or whatever it is, Right. So to me, it all comes down to how it affects the IRR and more importantly, how it's going to affect my reputation. Is Bo going to bring me extra deals as a result of just powering forward? How, 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 is, how is my reputation going to be affected moving forward, depending on how I do this? The, 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 you, know, you have to separate principle from long-term earnings on deals. And what I mean by that is, is so many investors, you know, this is, a, this, is, this is a field in which it's type A personalities, hard driving, squeeze every blood you can, you know, win, 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 negotiate, 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 do everything you can to, to, to earn for your investors. But everyone loses sight of the, of the forest through the trees and the end game, right? And so what happens is people see $100,000 and the principle of the matter is, it ain't my problem. The seller should fix this, right? It's just the principle of the matter, Bo. The seller needs to fix this. He didn't tell me about Gavin Ias. His damn problem, we need to go down $100,000 or $200,000. Instead, you need to be thinking about, okay, if I close on this thing and I do $9,000 in renovations and I take up rent $150 a month and I hold this for four years and I have this event, am I going to earn my 18% IRR or 20% IRR? Yes, right? That's mm -hmm. what people need to be thinking about because it's that competitive. If you're the only guy in the world under contract, sure, you have the, you have the ability to be able to negotiate, right? But that ain't never the case anymore. Mm -hmm. Bo, I'll give you a quick example. Let me introduce you to Jake Stenziano here. On our fourth deal, <laughs> we're talking about broken windows on a 22 unit for 500 bucks. And we were actually saying the seller has to pay for this. Fast forward five years later, that, that property has been refied twice. It's a cash monster. And we right. almost made that mistake. I don't know what stopped us. Maybe I said to Jake, I said, maybe to Jake, Jake, 500 bucks. You know what? 
what's well, 500 bucks, right? But at the time when you're struggling as a new investor and you want to have that ego and you know you're right, she should have, they should have fixed the windows. What's 500 bucks, like you said, but don't lose the forest through the trees. It's a perfect yeah. example. We've done that a lot of times. I'll give you an example on a 281 unit deal that we had. It's an $11 million owner finance deal. We have no money coming out of our pockets. We're actually getting a hundred grand in closing. We are negotiating to get $20,000 of a cable contract that they, that they, they, they really right. did owe it to us. It was ours, right? But are we going to sit there and fool around about a $20,000 cable contract when we've already refied $5 million out of that deal three years later, and we have basically money coming every single month. And that's an amazing deal. So yeah. that's the tip of the day, everybody. Do not lose the forest through the trees. Remember, egos and blind spots. That's what Ray Dalio says. And that's truly important. Look at the long-term goal. It's the hundred year real estate mindset. You're going for the long term. You have to be a person of character and separate that aside and say to yourself, is it worth it? If it's not, then step aside and let someone else take it over. But if it is, and what Bo is telling you, man, take, go for it. It is that principle stuff that, that fires you up though. Cause, and, and it was a different market five, six years ago too, yes. but you're, you're sitting there saying, look, this is, this is something that we're going to have to, you know, carry this contract forward. We should be you know, compensated for that. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, <laughs> it was just no. The answer just kept being no. And I was like, yeah, we, we, we ate it. We ate it. But it was yeah. frustrating at the time because it was the principle. Like, you feel like you're getting screwed. Yeah. You know? and, so. it's, and it's and egos come into, in, into account quick. My ego was just... bad five years ago. Like, I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm fucking guilty, man. I'm telling you right now. Listen, I was too. I, I, yeah. I would take offense. I mean, early in my brokerage career, I, I would take offense all the time when sellers and buyers would, wouldn't just play ball on things they should have they should have owned up to or should have taken care of. But in, as, you, as, you, as you're more and more experienced in this business, you understand the power of accumulating more units, right? Yes. The bigger you get, the more powerful you are. And the whole game here is not to earn the most profit per property. It's to build a portfolio that is earning at enough money to meet your returns. Mm -hmm. That's more powerful than anything else. Like I told you, that guy who does only off market, he may make more profit per purchase, but he ain't shit compared to this guy over here who's built, who's building a three to 5,000 unit portfolio, whose cash flow now as a portfolio is so powerful, it allows him to buy a four cap asset that's in the pathway of development in a market that five years from now will be like a seven cap, right? Because mm -hmm. he's added values and, yeah. and, it, and it's putting off a 10% cash on cash. So these guys who have enough portfolio cash flow, you may think they're nuts buying something at a four cap, but they have the vision and the cash flow to be able to, 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 to compensate for that very little um, cash flow. And they have that. cash flow behind them to buy them time on said, right. yeah. the future. And those guys get bigger yeah. and bigger and better and more sexy to every broker. And so when you have that kind of support behind you, when things come up during a transaction, it becomes less shit to you. You're like, eh, I don't give it. I don't. I don't care about the twenty thousand dollar windows. Like, Bo, we're closing. Tell the seller we're closing. And so then, Bo and Bo hears that he's like, this dude's a baller. He's a baller every <laughs> time I work with him, and I can't wait to do another deal with a guy like that. And you right? want to feed so, that guy, exactly. Right. Yes. So here, here, let me let me give you the inside world of, of how of how how these phone calls work. Right. So the kind of investor you want to be is the guy who gets called before the deal comes to market. So Jake and Gino, the sellers, call me up. They're like, Bo, listen, um, my partners and I have been talking. You know, we own Palm Terrace Apartments over in Daytona Beach. We're thinking about selling it. We've, 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 we've added a good bit of value. We've left some, left the next guy. Give us your BOV on this deal. Tell you what you think it's worth. And we're going to list with you. I'm going to move forward, right? So as soon as I had that conversation, this is what every broker does. I hang up that phone. And I already know about my top 10 guys I'm going to call. These are the guys who always close. They pay the right price. They don't retrade. They talk well about the property. They make me look good. The seller falls in love with them. And so what happens is immediately, before I even had a listing agreement signed, I ain't even done the BOV yet. I'm calling up George. I'm like, George, listen, Jake and Gino just called me up. They got Palm Terrace Apartments. Yeah, yeah, that one over in Daytona Beach. Yeah, that thing is sweet. I know, I know, I know. They just called me up. Listen, they're going to be listing with me. You're still going to have to compete for this. It's still going to market. We're going to do the whole dog and pony show. But I just want to give you a heads up about it. So what happens is, is George now has the benefit 
of knowing which asset it is. So he's going to drive by the outside. He's not going to get outside and walk around like some, you know, freak. He's not going to talk to property <laughs> managers. He's not going to talk to leasing agents. He's going to drive around. He can start to see, okay, this thing needs to be painted. It needs a roof. Landscaping could be done. I could redo the sign. He starts talking to his property managers about what he could lease it for. He starts talking to his contractor about renovation costs. He starts talking to his lender about what they could do. So he's got, he's got a three week head start, right? Because it takes me about three weeks from the time I get that call to put together marketing packages, do my video, my professional photography, my drone shots. I build a drop box with all the, you know, the survey, the title work, the floor plans, the market, all this stuff, right? It takes me about three weeks. And this is why, guys, and everyone who's listening to this, this is why 10 days after a listing comes on the market, there's 15 offers. It's because 15 guys got a head start and they know the market like the back of their hands. In eight seconds, these elite investors that I work with, they can tell me in any market that they work in exactly what they're going to get on the rents after the renovation. They know exactly what it's going to cost to renovate it. They know exactly what they're going to sell it for in four years. They know this stuff already, right? And these 10 to 15 guys, I'm just using 10 to 15. Every broker has a certain number of folks that they, they work with. Um, these 10 to 15 guys, they have consistently every 30 to 60 days for 5, 10, 15 years, they're calling every multifamily broker in the market, not just the productive ones, but the ones who do one or two deals a year, they're calling every multifamily broker every 30 to 60 days. And they're calling their lenders because lenders procure deals as well. They know about deals that are coming to market and they're putting, they're calling them every 30 to 60 days and just having conversations. Right. And over time, as you can imagine, yes, it's uh, the conversations are about business, but it's also about family. It's about hobbies. It's about what you did on the weekend. How's your wife doing? Did your kids get into that, to that college they were talking about? How was the motorcycle race over the weekend? Did you, go to, to, did you go to Formula One past weekend, right? So you can imagine the people who are most elite at this, who are talking to the brokers who do 93% of every closing consistently every 30 to 60 days over a five and 10 and 20 year period, you can imagine the type of relationships that get built. And that's why when Jake and Gino call me, as soon as I hang up, I'm giving those guys a heads up. And that works to Jake and Gino's benefit as the seller too, because I just chose the best buyers in the world and gave them a head start so they can bring me the most powerful price that I could possibly get, right? Yep. And so the rest of the world ha don't have that, doesn't have that benefit. They've only They're got- They're not in the inner circle. You know what I mean? So they, don't have, they only have, they have 14 days to learn a market, drive by the asset, walk through it, talk to renovations, blah, 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 right? And so it's tough. It's tough to compete against those guys who have learned the game, which is the brokerage. Last long question. What is the love factor? Ah. Oh, man, here we go. We're getting dirty, dirty. <laughs> love factor, brother. <laughs> so um, so I, I created this equation, right? And this is, this, is a really, this is a really good way to quantify whether you're doing all the things right as an investor. The love, the love factor is an equation. It goes like this. It is the number of deals you were shown by a broker or a seller or a lender, any referral source whatsoever that, that, that um, is in charge of listings. The number of listings you were shown during a year divided by the total number of closings. So we talked about it before the show. For instance, if you were a guy who bought 100 plus units, market rate, weren't older than 1980, it's not newer than 2005. Um, you want value add uh, and you only like, you know, Jacksonville, Tallahassee, Gainesville and Ocala. If, if I showed you every closing that happened of that criteria mm -hmm. during a 12 month period, and let's say there were a hundred closings and I, I showed you that spreadsheet and you went down that spreadsheet and you're like, all right, I saw that one. I saw that one. I saw that one. And you only saw like 20 of those hundred. You suck. Oh. You're, do, you're doing everything wrong, right? Think about it. What's the worst feeling in the world? The worst feeling in the world. I didn't know that sold. What the hell? Exactly. The in the world. There's 80 closings that happen and you never even freaking knew about it. That's the worst, right? The people who win this game, the guys who have the biggest portfolio on the planet, they're the ones who see the most deals. They don't underwrite better than you do. 
I listen, I can teach my 16 year old how to underwrite a $20 million complex. It ain't freaking hard. It ain't hard to teach someone how to manage managers. It ain't hard to eventually learn what renovation costs are. All that stuff's easy. The name of this game is how many at bats you can get. You how many see a deals lot of you see? Mm -hmm. You right. see a lot of pitches because it's a probably it's a yeah. it's a statistical equation. That's all it is. Most guys are roughly the as as good as everybody else on how to how to buy, how to finance it, how to manage it, all that stuff, how to renovate it, how to add the value. I mean, some people are better than the others, but. The guys who are great at having deals come to them, those are the dudes who grow. Mm -hmm. I, I think I just heard it's Saber metrics. You got to see a lot of pitches and you're looking at on base percentage, not batting average, right? Is that fair to say? That's right. That's right. Done. Let's take a quick time out here from our sponsor. Are you looking for ways to improve your life? Here at Jake and Gino, our mission is to empower students through financial education and the vehicle of multifamily investing. Yes, Jake. We agree that a person with financial intelligence can change the world for the better. We've created our proprietary three-step framework, buy right, manage right, and finance right, that we teach to our community. This framework, along with education, our one-on-one -on -one mentorship, on-site boot camps, and the amazing community has propelled our students to massive success. We've all been there. We've had so many students that have been able to shift their mindset, overcome limiting beliefs, and set a clear path to achieve their goals. Whether you're currently fixing and flipping, wholesaling, or buying single family rentals, and you know that multifamily investing is the right vehicle for you, I encourage you to visit jakeandgino.com forward slash apply to schedule your complimentary consultation with our team and I want to let you know this isn't a high pressure sales call. It's really just a discovery call to get to know each other better and see if we're a good fit for working together. And if for any reason we're not a good fit, our team has tons of resources we will share with you to help you along your journey. If you're ready to stop spinning your wheels, go to jakeandgino.com forward slash apply and schedule your call now. All right. So. Hard money day one versus a better price. Come on. What's the deal? Hard, hard money day one or a slightly better price with that hard money day one? Hard what, money what, day one. I hard want that hard money, Gino. Hard I money day hard one. one. Unpack that sucker for me. And in fact, I think I just won. I'm working on a deal in Gainesville right now. It's, it's actually the number one most popular property I've ever worked on in my entire career, 20 years. It was a 116 unit building, completely vacant. Uh, a location on the on a lake, um, unbelievable asset, um, has development capability for another 120 units. I got 14 offers in, I think it was 14 days or something like that. And um, I think it was eight of the 14 offers were, were at, um, were at uh, pricing guidance or higher. And, and, seven, and I think four of them were, were right in line with the same price. The guy who slapped down a huge deposit hard day one is who won the deal was he even at what was he at price or he, below he, he actually he was above pricing guidance but oh, so just, were he's others just going, he's just going crazy there so were others right but here's the deal here's what's powerful about what he did i just did a video on this on my youtube channel the one of the biggest mistakes i see investors make is that they are they are trying to pay just enough to win a deal it's the biggest freaking mistake you can make, right? It's the garage sale mentality. You're walking to a garage sale. You want to buy that, that, you know, that you want to buy that widget. And you're like, you know, what's the minimum I can pay? Will you take 50 cents? No, you know, no, I want 80 cents. We take eight, we, we take 56 cents, right? So you're, you're trying to, you're trying to get that, that lowest, lowest bottom dollar. And then some other guy walks in, he's like, fuck that 85 cents. And 85 cents still worked. It met his pro forma. It met his IRR. And he wins the deal. The biggest mistakes are trying to pay just enough. This guy worked his numbers and was true to himself and said, hey, I can pay this and it's still going to work. This is the absolute max I can pay. So he walks into a negotiation and he just lays this shit down and the <laughs> broker gets this offer and he's like, damn, damn. And he calls up the seller and he wins, right? And that's the way these guys win over and over again. The guy who's just trying to pay enough, he doesn't do anywhere near as many deals as the other guy who just lays it down, right? Now, listen, the guy who just tries to pay enough 
when he gets a deal, may make more profit than the other guy. But again, he ain't going to buy as many deals as the other guy. And I'm not telling you to break your IRR. I'm not telling you to overpay. I'm saying pay as much as you possibly can and still make your returns because you're trying to build a portfolio. And the bigger your portfolio, the more investors are going to want to invest with you. And the more powerful you become, you want to become the guy who you just can't compete with. Okay. Super, the guy super, that the broker super subjective. Told Super subjective, but you're at 10.5, no hard money. You're at 10 million, hard money. Who wins 90% of the time there? Depends on who the buyer is. If, if the guy who's at 10 million with hard money is a baller and yeah. always closes and never retrades, and he's just a killer, and you know he's, I mean, and it also depends on due diligence and closing date, that guy has a really good chance of getting chosen. If the guy yeah. at 10.5, owns two assets. I've never done a deal with him. Um, you know, I've checked, he doesn't have many references. It's, you know, a half million dollars. You want the sure thing. You want the slam dunk. You want yeah. the slam dunk, right? It's because it's so difficult. If the, if the 10, five guy doesn't close, it puts Restart me in the, the seller. Uh, Not only start the process, go. I have to go back to buyers and tell them what happened. And right. They're like, and, Oh, you stinky. What's wrong with you? You got, you got to work. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. No words. No words, man. Um, all right. So we talked about the love factor. Let's help folks increase that love factor. I know you gave some tips, but let's, let's really dive in. So it's crystal clear walking away from this. How are we getting more love from Bo? How are we increasing <laughs> that love factor? All right. So let me go through, let me go through some do's and don'ts that I regularly see that, that people just, the problem is the people who don't have the greatest reputation, they don't know they don't have the greatest reputation, right? Like a, a broker's never gonna call you after a transaction and be like, yo, Jake and Gino, um, by the way, the reason I haven't sent you anything in the last six months is because remember that thing you did during a transaction? Yeah, that was stupid. No broker's ever gonna tell you that. You just have to recognize that you have to practice empathy. Empathy is the number one word in this business. When you can think about the seller and you can put the seller's hat on, on everything that comes across your desk, you're going to be legendary in the reputation business and people are going to want to do business with you, right? So for instance, here's a couple of things. Uh, let's say a listing comes to market, right? And it's, um, let's say it's priced at $10 million. Uh, you're doing the underwriting and you can't get, you can't get any higher than $8,500,000, right? I get this all the time. I get an investor who calls me after like, Bo, like, dude, where did you get $10 million? That's ridiculous. These sales comps you use don't even make sense. The rent comps, you can never earn those kind of rents. Like, I, you know, listen, I came in at eight million five, an eight million five hundred thousand dollars, you know, take or leaving kind of thing, right? That's one of the worst things you can do to turn down a, a property because here's the deal: it's gonna sell. I'm gonna sell it for ten million. How many listings do you see, Jake and Gina, that come across your desk that you, if you went back and researched it, didn't sell? Like, it just doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't happen anymore, right? And so when you show your ass by trying to convince the broker that you, it's not like the broker's going to be like, oh, you know what, Mr. Buyer, you're right. I'm going to take 15% off this. <laughs> yes. You know, hey, I'm going to go back. Let, let me you told me. Shit, I didn't realize it. <laughs> let me tell you, this buyer just called me up and he's like, you know, I think he's right on his comps. We need to take a, never happens. It's not going to happen, right? The correct way to turn down a property if it's overpriced and it's over, I don't understand, it's under, overpriced for you. Right. That's the main thing. It's overpriced. It ain't overpriced. It's going to sell. That is the market value. Somebody's that paying it. It's just Someone's might not paying. be you. Yeah. And so that, that's, a, that's a comp. An appraiser is going to use that. The correct way is to give compliment, compliment, compliment. And then you say, listen, I, I, did, I ran the numbers. The returns don't work for me, but please keep me on your, on your listing list. You know I'm always going to give you po a positive feedback. So you, you called off the broker and you're like, listen, Great listing. I love how it looks. Your presentation of your materials was fantastic. I love that video you did. I love your pictures. By the way, tell the seller he did a great job on that entry sign. And I love how he broke up the colors on the building. Really nice work. And even if you can do this in an email that I can pass on to the seller, that makes you look even better. And then you say, hey, listen, the returns don't work for me, but, but, but please keep me on your list. I, you know, I'm always going to be positive feedback. 
that's a perfect way that 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 shows that shows respect that builds your reputation with me that makes me want to i could bring you 10 listings in a row and from here on out you're known as the love doctor because that's how you break up with somebody that's you how know you break this up is with the someone. love doctor this is the proper it's way you, to break up with someone in multifamily. your eyes baby are so beautiful they just don't work for me right now okay <laughs> And you're not, you don't make enough money for me, all right? I'm looking for a little sugar mama, so. That's right. <laughs> Keep going. Um, this is great stuff, man. Keep going with it if you got more. I don't want to sleep. Yeah, yeah. Me. So another one, I mean, let's talk about commissions. You know, I, I see this all the time. So one of the, one of the, one of the biggest disparities I see during a transaction is, let's say a $150,000 issue comes up during the transaction, right? So buyer and seller propose, you know what? Um, none of us knew about this. Buyer says, I'll eat 50 grand seller, you eat 50 grand, broker, you eat 50 grand, right? Now this, let's say it's a $10 million deal. Let's say a commission on that is $300,000 or, or, you know, whatever it is. So let's just say, yeah, let's just say, uh, let's say $200,000 to keep the numbers even, right? So what happens is, is the, the $50,000 to the buyer on a $10 million deal is, I mean, what is that? What's 50,000 divided, what is that? Like 0.5%, 50,000 divided by 10 million. Yeah, that's one half of 1%, right? So the buyer is now going to pay 100.05% on the purchase price. The seller is going to take home 99.995% or 99.95% of his price. And the broker is going to take home 75% of what he did correctly, he did his job, he brought the buyers, he put two buy a buyer and a seller together. He didn't have anything to do with the $150,000 issue, but he's going to eat 25% of the commission, right? So what happens is the broker oftentimes gets squeezed and the broker, and, and, and when, you know, egos get involved, so buyer and seller are like, well, most broker, if you ain't going to do it, then we're all walking, right? So what does the broker do? He's like, all right, cool. You know, let's, let's move forward. I'm going to make two fifty dollars instead of $300,000 or whatever. How many deals am I bringing in that buyer after that transaction? Zero for the rest of my 25 year remaining career. Blackballed, you know, done so. <laughs> you know, because it's just, it doesn't make any sense, right? I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, listen, and here's the other thing. And, and I'm telling you all this, not because I'm trying to save my own commissions or save other. No, you got to eat, man. And you're not going to waste your time with people that, you know. It, are this not, is just yeah. human. This is the way a human yeah. brain works is human motivation, Right. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense to do that because if listen, you had one buyer potentially for an asset, it changes things. When you have 50 buyers for an asset, well, you know, you gotta, right. you gotta adjust, uh, you know, and listen, if, if that extra practice. 50 grand you're making yeah. the broker eat, if that extra 50 grand makes a difference, whether you buy this or not, you should never be buying this in the first place because mm -hmm. you're doing everything wrong in your pro forma. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, and, and I, I get, and I get the, I get those, you know, not as often, but you know, it's, it's usually from um, bulls in a China shop kind of investors. And they usually have a short investment career. You know, they just, they just, they almost get a thrill out of bullying people, bullying buyers, bullying brokers, and, and, and the opposite happens. And it just doesn't make any sense. Instead, if, if the, if the buyer were to eat the full 150 or the, or the two of them agree on 75 and 75 and you leave the broker alone, the fact that that happened, I can't wait to bring you more deals. I recognize as a broker, you could have come to me and tried to beat me up and you didn't. So I want to bring you more deals. I want to know that when I bring you the next deal, I'm never going to get touched no matter what comes up, mm -hmm. right? You respect me. You respect how I make a living. You respect the fact that my job was practically done when I brought the two of you together and I shepherded this to closing and for you to then disrespect someone doesn't make any sense. And you would have done, you would be the same way if the hat was, if the hat was different. Right. Mm -hmm. um, other stuff. Let me see here. I've got a whole, I got a whole list. I'll, let me just do one more for you and you can tell me if you want more. Um, oh, returning phone calls. So, you know, this is, this is so, this is so simple. As investors, you guys get calls from brokers all the time, right? I mean, you get inundated. Hey, my name's Bo Beery. Do you want to sell? Hey, my name's Bo Beery. Do you want to sell? Like that's, that happens all the time, right? And oftentimes, brokers never get called back. Or, or we, we call investors to introduce ourselves. Hey, my name's Bo Beery. I see you bought XYZ apartments. I want to introduce myself. 
would love to talk to you about what your acquisition criteria is, whatever it is, and I leave a voicemail, right? Most of the time, brokers never get called back. If you can become the type of investor who returns every single phone call, right, to a broker, that, that makes that broker feel special because it's, it's, almost like, it's almost like a minority of the time. And listen, you don't have to have 25 minute phone calls. If the guy called you back and left a message trying to sell your property, call him back and say, hey, Bo, hey, listen, thanks for giving me a phone call. I've heard of, I've heard of you before. Um, I've actually seen you on social media. You do a great job. I heard you're really good at your stats. We're not ready to sell XYZ apartments. That's about a four year more hold that we're holding after another four years. But tell you what, call me in three years. Let's talk about it. And what you do when you do that is you've now taken that broker away from calling you 60 more times on that one asset over the next four years. Give them a deadline. We all want to be able to put a, a date in our phone or in our, in our CRM, or whatever, right? Or if he's calling you, just introducing yourself, give him a call back. Tell him about your criteria. Hey, thanks for giving me a call, man. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we are looking for more stuff. We're looking for deals between 25 and 100 units, blah, 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 blah. Or, or you know, even if there's, listen, even the brokers you don't like, right? Even the people who, who maybe even have a bad reputation, they can still bring you deals over time. You want to be like, you want to be a politician in this business, right? You want, to, you want all the people to love you. You want all the brokers to love you. Lenders come up with lots of deals and property managers know about deals that are coming up for sale. Those are the three categories you want to have on a rotating basis every 30 to 60 days. And you're just making quick little phone calls and checking in. Biggest mistake I made starting out, you know, hands down. I mean, we started with small, like 25 units, you know, back in, you know, early 2010s. And I just, you know, this is for everybody out there listening when you're starting out. You, you got to let this stuff sink in because my mentality was the broker's a sales guy. They need to bring me stuff because it's not, guys, we got to get clear on this. They're the ones that are going to provide you the meat. And, and it, like if you're buying hold like Gino and myself to create the cash flow to live the rest of your life off of. So it's, it's a big deal. So you can't overlook that. I think that's definitely for myself when, when that mentality change and, and when he was talking about that ego, you got to drop that ego and look long-term. Okay. You, you got it. It's like, you know, we're talking about seeing the forest through the trees. It, it, it's, it's real. Yeah. Uh, so I think for the folks getting started, you, you have to take note of this stuff. Um, tell us a little bit about the book and where we can get it. Sure. So this is what it looks like. It's on Amazon. I'll show it here. Uh, multifamily investors who dominate. It's an inside look. Love that on title. Health. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so it's on Amazon and hardcover. It's on Audible on, on, the, on the audio. I'm the one who reads it with, with my crazy tone. Uh, and it's also on Kindle. Um, it's, it's sold, and the book is all about, it's, it's literally a step-by-step -step strategic process on how you become an investor where all the deals flood to you. At the end of every chapter, I literally give you steps on how to do this. Um, that's one way. My YouTube channel um, is called Bo Knows Multifamily. And I don't put out fluffy stuff. Do you stuff, break a man. knee this or a like... bat over your knee when you strike out? Is it like, you know, Bo knows this, <laughs> Bo knows that or what? That's great. <laughs> not, so, not so much. Okay. Um, but I have videos on there on how to buy more deals, how to do letter of intents that win multiple offers, um, how, you, how, you do, uh, how you structure your PSAs, um, all kinds of, basically, it's like anything that I, that I encounter during transactions that I think could benefit, I do a video on it. Um, and then lastly, my website is bobeery.com, B-E-A-U-B-E-E-R-Y.com. Now, no matter what market you're in, the reason you want to visit that website is because if you go to the, the top and you click on resources, you'll see all the markets that I cover in Florida. And when you click on any of those markets, you will see a whole bunch of buttons on there about market intel, rents, occupancies. I put every single sale that occurs in the market over 10 units, I, you know, economics, um, you know, top employers, all the buttons I have on each of those markets are the buttons you want to master for your market. Because these elite investors I told you, are, they're, they're, they're killing it for two reasons. Number one, they're getting the call from the broker ahead of time. And number two, they have mastered every one of those metrics on my website to the point where when a deal comes available, that's why they're able to act very, very quickly. They know, already know who the top employers are. They know what the rents are, the occupancies, the absorption. They already have possible. assets there. They know how it's going to perform. Boom. It's just rinse and repeat. Let's go. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you got to know that information for your market. You can't, just, you can't just look at the entire United States for deals unless you've mastered the United States. Pick all the markets and master those markets like the back of your hand. 
Gino, Bo likes his money hard. Let's wrap us up here. <laughs> Mr. Bo Beery, 1999 graduate, University of Florida, goes to work in property management for a couple of years and says, 444 units? These guys are making a killing. Where are the owners? I got to get me some of this. So he goes back to school, gets his MBA, does his GMATs, and he finds the love of his life. Falls in love, but he's baby. like, dude, I want to go into development. But I got to get stuck in Gainesville because she's more important than the development. Keeps working through it. 2004, 2005, starts his brokerage, start working the multifamily gig. And fast forward to today, one of the top multifamily brokers in the state of Florida, in the Northeast Florida, and just an, an amazing contribution to the investors and really giving brokers a good light. Because most of us investors honestly see brokers as just people out there making 3%. They don't see right. all the hard work that it takes to put a deal together. They don't see all of that Stephen Covey quadrant two stuff that's really not yeah. urgent, but very important. There's a lot of work. It's really, if you want to become- Those investors are crazy. Let's be honest. We're nuts. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you want to become a successful broker, you have to have the entrepreneurial mindset where you're not getting paid today. You're going to be getting paid two and three years down the road. So it's a testament to his hard work, to his work ethic, and to be able to build a, a community. So hats off to you both. Thanks for uh, taking the time today. Thank you. I appreciate it, guys. I tell you what, a great quote from, a, from an investor to cap this off for me. I won't get it perfectly right. But he said, you know, give, given the value of brokers, he said, you know, for one or two percent, I can I can have a broker find me assets or sell me assets. And I get the benefit of 10, 15, 20 years of the relationships he's built with other operators that, that I get to buy for basically free. I don't have to pay him salary. I don't have to pay him benefits. I don't have to pay him bonuses. I don't have to give him vacation time. This guy is out working for me for free. And I only pay this dude when he brings me something. What? Mm -hmm. Not a bad relationship, but really appreciate <laughs> it. Had a blast, uh, you know, wealth and knowledge and just appreciate your time today. Thanks guys. Thanks everyone.